will be will be famous. Okay, so we have gone live. Um, welcome to the Quant University Winter School 2021. It's uh, February the 23rd, and uh, we are excited to host Daniel Duffy and John Mark uh, on an exciting 90 minute introductory workshop on Hilbert spaces and applications in machine learning, uh, some theory and foundations. So this is an opportunity for us to kind of you know, learn from the experts who've been working in the field, both from a theoretical perspective, but also from a practical perspective. And as you know, Quant University has been hosting sessions kind of focusing on the intersection of data science, machine learning, and quantitative finance over the last year or so. And we hosted the, the summer school and we had a lot of interesting topics and speakers who have generously given their time and uh, put together amazing lecture content to help you kind of contextualize how machine learning and data science and quantitative finance are all kind of coming together. So uh, we continued the tradition in fall and we had uh, more than 30 speakers in 2020 contribute various topics uh, to the summer and the winter and the, and the fall school. And we're continuing the tradition in 2021 wherein we have um, had amazing speakers, kind of a, a diverse set of topics we have focused on this um, winter. We have had quantum machine learning, we have had explainability related topics, and uh, we have uh, kind of had a gamut of various interesting topics to uh, bring out like you know, what are the core areas which are in focus and uh, we made sure that uh, all the content is something which you can digest and also you can build upon as you continue your learning journey. So I'm going to share a couple of slides just to introduce before we hand over the stage to our uh, eminent speakers. Uh, give me one second. I'm just going to um, switch screen for a bit. So uh, today's topic is Hilbert Space Kernel Methods for Machine Learning Background and Foundations. And uh, for people who don't know Quant University and joining us for the first time, welcome. Uh, we are based out of Boston, Massachusetts, and uh, we started the consulting advisory in 2013. Uh, we also have focus predominantly on educational related topics, and we have various programs in the context of quantitative methods, data science, and enabling various technologies uh, to basically help build out uh, pragmatic applications in the context of machine learning and financial service applications. Uh, we are also building a platform called as the QSandbox, which enables you to accelerate your development of various machine learning applications in the quant finance world. And if you're interested, please reach out to us and we'd be happy to give you a demo and see if that would be of interest. So as I mentioned, the winter school uh, goes on from January to March, and uh, we still have uh, four more lectures. And we have already had uh, eight lectures throughout the, uh, the semester. And uh, every week we have um, had people uh, kind of learn various new topics. But in addition to that, we are also hosting formal courses. So we have students who are taking multiple courses in the context of um, learning the basics of uh, Python with data science, and then accelerating their learning through machine learning applications and also focusing on model risk management. And in um, spring of uh, 2021, we are adding a couple more courses to the catalog. Uh, two courses, which I'm very excited about, uh, are one is the algorithmic auditing of machine learning and AI models. And the second course is on risk and ML models, stress testing, scenario testing, and evaluation. So these two courses have been offered in partnership with uh, Premier, the Professional Risk Managers Association. And I'm very excited about this partnership because uh, in addition to these new courses, we have also been able to take the three core courses we have in the machine learning certificate program and it's made available on demand through their platform. So uh, if you're interested in taking any of these three courses, it should be readily available on the, the Premier platform. And if you're interested to know more about some of the courses we're offering, uh, there is a premier webinar, which is uh, going to be for free tomorrow, and it's going to be focused on risk and machine learning models, uh, stress scenario testing and evaluation, and I'm going to be covering some of the aspects of risk, and machine learning models, and introduce concepts of concept drift, uh, model drift, data drift, and also talk a little bit about how you should be planning scenario and 
stress testing for machine learning models, especially when you see a lot of volatility out there in the markets. And also with COVID-19, everybody is questioning whether the models that have been building uh, are robust enough to handle various scenarios. So I welcome you all to join this complimentary webinar tomorrow. And the link is out there. So please feel free to register. And or if you just go to the premier website, prmia.org, you'll find all the registration information. So uh, without further ado, I would uh, welcome our eminent speakers for, uh, for today. So uh, Daniel and I, uh, you know, I, I got to know Daniel's work a long, long time ago when I was still at my MathWorks uh, you know, uh, tour of duty, if you will, uh, 2000, 2008, 2009 timeframe. And uh, for people who joined a little bit early, Daniel was uh, you know, uh, showing all the books he has on his shelf. And uh, I still have some of his books uh, focusing on C++ and uh, quantitative finance. And it was fascinating to kind of, you know, not only look at the concepts, but also get the implementations. And I was building some bridges using uh, MATLAB and C++ Daniel at that point. And um, it's kind of amazing to see how uh, generously uh, Daniel has kind of you know, put on all his thoughts in, the, in various books. And also John Mark um, has uh, done amazing work in the context of uh, Hilbert Spaces. And I'm very excited to know about his new Python library. And uh, he's at MPG Partners. And uh, um, so Daniel and uh, John Mark, I would love to, for you to introduce yourselves when you start presenting. Um, that way I don't miss out any of the details. This one is a special workshop. Usually we have one speaker and we usually have for one hour, but today we are glad to have two eminent speakers and it's going to be a 90 minute long workshop. So what we will do is uh, we will first have Daniel present and then we will do a short Q&A, five minute Q&A, and then we will have John Mark present and then we have a short um, a 15 minute, um, 10 to 15 minute uh, uh, question answer slash virtual fireside chat. So that's kind of the, the plan for today. Um, so uh, Danielle, welcome. And I'm gonna make you the presenter. <clears throat> oh, that's nice. Yeah, just a question, Sri. Um, it's 20 to six now here. Um, I've got until, let's say quarter past, five, quarter past six, is that correct? Yeah, so you know, we're kind of planning maybe 40 minutes, 30, 35 to 40 minutes. It should, it should be possible 35, I can do it. Try and put into 35 and time for uh, 10 minutes for questions, maybe. Absolutely, yeah. That, that should be that. okay. I've sure. got 17 slides, so we just talk fast, basically. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And okay. we'll be sharing all the slides through yeah. qu.academy. So for people who are interested in getting the slides and the recorded version of the video, sure. no uh, problem. please make sure you register at qu.academy and we'll be sending out the slides through our platform. Great. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, is it my turn? Or, uh... Yes, if you could uh, share your uh, slides. Um, then oh, yeah. share screen, yeah? Yes. Is that okay now? Yes, we can see your screen. Okay, what about this stuff at the top? That just disappears at some stage. Okay. So everybody can see my first slide, right? Absolutely. Oh, that's, that's the most difficult part of my courses. Great. Thank you very much, Sri and Jean-Marc and Emma. Uh, my part of the, uh, the afternoon or the morning session is Hilbert Space Kernel Method. So that's a, it's not a three-letter acronym, it's a four-letter acronym. So before you go into any libraries or so, I, I reckon it's useful to know what you're really talking about. So what's the R, what's the K, what's the H, what's the H, what, what is the S? So I intend to give an overview of what each of these topics entail mathematically. So it's, it's uh, a new branch of a, a branch of Mathematics called functional analysis. So I will try within the 35 minute span to give enough background to, to explain these buzzwords, of course, Hilbert spaces. And I'm not even talking about Banach spaces or Sobolev spaces yet, but we just keep it to Hilbert spaces. Um, get enough background. We will give a number of real nitty gritty algorithms and so, which actually are being used by these kernel methods. And you can compare them to the, way, to the way people are using neural networks at the moment with gradient descent, for example. So within the 35 minutes, I hope to give an overview of the history, where it's coming from, where it's going to. And I'm sort of preparing for the, uh, the arrival of um, Dr. Mercier when he will give a demo of, this, uh, of his library in, in Python. Okay, 
So you, I suppose most people know who I am. There's my email address. We have a website as well. And on my website, I've got my courses and so on. But the relevance to machine learning in this particular seminar, uh, and at the end, I've got a slide on the data flow diagram. I've got two MSc theses from my students. Uh, one is from last two years ago on the Sabre model for neural networks. And the, the one last year, which is a hot topic, it's, one of my students did a rough uh, volatility, rough Heston model for using neural networks and his conclusions and so on. So you can read more about it on my website. So it's not my objective to talk about artificial neural networks today, although we will every now and again make a remark at the end on the comparisons with the kernel methods, but there might be something for you to read as, as, as uh, one of the audience. Okay, so that's basically what we want to do. So the uh, uh, let me next slide. My slide doesn't seem to be working. Oh yeah, here we are. It's a bit slow. Maybe it's my... Okay. Before I start out, I want to talk about the goals. So what's the background? The background to what? To kernel methods in particular, but also at a deeper level, the background to functional analysis, where kernels came from. Kernels weren't invented by, by machine learning people. They were invented by mathematicians at least 120 years ago. I want to give a, no, a global overview, if that's possible, to kernel methods, the kernel Hilbert space. Some remarks on machine learning, some examples. And the examples I will be giving will be uh, a mean discrepancy uh, algorithm for statistical distributions to, to, to test a null hypothesis. The other one will be uh, optimization methods using the kernel methods and comparing to how it's done using artificial neural networks. So I've got two examples. John Mark has many more examples and the, he's done it all in Python and C++. So it may, it's a good preparation, I would say, for uh, the second session. So the examples I would be giving are the, indeed the two sample problem comparing probability distributions, uh, vector machines, and some conclusions at the end and some questions. The, uh, to make a long story short, uh, the comparison between kernel methods and let's say artificial and neural networks based on let's say linear algebra and iterative methods is that the errors can be quantified with the kernel methods a priori and not uh, a posteriori using extensive testing. So that's probably, I might as well tell immediately what the differences are. And there's a new development, there's a lot of research being done in this area where you actually quantify probabilities you're working with Lebesgue uh, functions, but they're actually quantified. So you can actually, basically to make a long story short again, you can calculate distances between probability spaces. So that's something which is quite useful. And something which I always had in my head all the time, I said, yeah, it's got to be quantified. So coming from a, uh, a numerical analysis background, you like to prove things a priori with error measures. So that's more or less the goals. So to see how it goes, uh, I will give an introduction to each of the concepts. I don't know how many people actually know functional analysis, so it's hard to say. Uh, I've, I've no idea if people do functional analysis at universities anymore uh, in mathematics. I, I'm not working in the university, but the, uh, in the old days, people do uh, did functional analysis. So I think it's um, more, uh, people are more concerned with differential equations and linear algebra. I don't know, but... Anyway, let's see how it goes. So I might as well, before we start, let's say, what is a kernel? So everybody's talking about it, but if you don't define it, everybody's got their own uh, ideas. It's a, basically a function of two variables, X and Y. Okay, so we call it K for kernel. Sometimes it's uh, uppercase, sometimes it's lowercase, depending on, on the way you write it up, but we'll see more later. So it's symmetric. So if I, X and Y are input variables, you might say a real, it's a real valued function where X and Y can be from any space. So it could be, X and Y could be um, arrays, it could be vectors of doubles or reals um, or complex numbers. And again, we're focusing down, and these are the kernels of interest. We're interested in positive kernels, and positive kernels I will find in a moment. But a positive kernel, kernels can be defined in finite dimensional space as well, 
these are generalizations of positive definite matrices, which everybody knows, I presume, if you know linear algebra, you know what a positive definite matrix is. So it's a generalization of a positive definite matrix. You've got sum of terms, basically, yeah? but in infinite dimensions, it's a, an integral. Okay, we'll see in a moment. So one of the nice things about the kernel methods is it's applicable to both finite dimensional and infinite dimensional problems. So the concepts as well, even. So the input space, as I've said, can be n-dimensional real space or complex space or even more generic spaces. So you can, when we go into kernels, you can add two kernels together. And it will also be a kernel, positive definite. Products of kernels are uh, also kernels and mappings between spaces we'll see later when you actually map one space into another. So you've got a kernel in the first space and that's mapped into a kernel in the second space. It makes it also a kernel. The difference of two kernels is not a kernel because you, you don't get positive definite uh, functions. Okay, so that's basically a kernel. So I've taken all the, the, the uh, hullabaloo out of what's a kernel. For all intents and purposes, it's a, it's a function of two variables, right? And um, in practice, and I'm sure uh, John Mark will agree, in practice, you don't really know, need to know a lot of the background uh, of feature maps and uh, Hilbert spaces as such but you can work uh, mostly with your kernels. So you've got whatever kernel it might be, uh, you just work with your kernels in real life, right? Yeah, of course, you don't, you don't need to know anything to program or to, uh, to use a library, but it helps, right? Okay, so where did it all begin? Gauss and Laplace, and maybe a Cauchy as well. In the old days, the old guys used to write in Latin because they wouldn't write in German or English. It's, it's too imprecise. So he, Gauss was doing his astronomical measurements of the planets, the, uh, the trajectories of the planets and so on. And he came across this uh, basically least squares problems, right? So Gauss invented least squares and maximum likelihood calculations as well, just like Laplace. And the very first uh, example of a kernel now immediately is the normal distribution function. So it's just a kernel of two variables, X and Y, of course. It's just the exponential of E, exponential minus epsilon squared uh, multiplied by the absolute difference between x and y squared. So that's a very simple example. And this has got very many generalizations as well. So my feeling is that of all the kernels, there are many kernels. The Gaussian kernel is pretty good still. John, John Mark can maybe say some, some more about it later on. So that's, that's just a kernel function. That's, that's taking maybe some of the mysticism out of the, uh, the topic. So we've got the k up and running. So we now need to go to the other part of the uh, definition. Okay, short history of kernels. Um, the kernels were basically uh, have arisen in the study of integral equations in the early 20th century. You've got all these guys, Hilbert, Schmidt, Volterra, Fredholm, Tricomi, and later on, Arangian, who he, he's the guy who actually coined the phrase, uh, uh, reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces. So you wrote the original article. So there's a lot of uh, numerical work as well. Uh, my own background in, in this area as well, in, in the early 70s, I started learning functional analysis as an undergraduate. Later on, I, I used functional analysis and applied functional analysis in my research for finite element methods. And I spent some time actually in France learning these finite element methods with the professors of uh, colleagues of uh, Jean Marc and so. Um, so there was a very heavy emphasis on kernel methods and the variational formulations, whatever. Later on, when I worked in industry, I actually used kernel methods for surface radiative heat transfer uh, when I was developing cathode ray tubes for black and white television. So the, the heat transfer in the cathode ray tube. So that's a long time ago. And uh, more recently, uh, as we speak, I'm finishing off my new PDE book. So it's another book for my bookshelf. Uh, partial, uh, partial integral differential equations in which you have kernel functions as well. Okay, so that's a bit of background. Um, the, most of the integral methods, we're talking about the, the past and the and present. Most of the integral met equations can be solved using Galerian methods, which are like finite element methods, collocation methods, numerical quadrature and so on. So there's a lot of uh, stuff going on. Uh, the, there are different kinds of kernel methods. You've got Fredholm and Volterra equations, but you've also got first and second kinds. You've got linear equations, nonlinear equations, 
And all of these methods can be analyzed using the method of functional analysis. So there's a, there's a deep theory of integral equations in, 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 in mathematical finance, whether that's going to be the overlap with machine learning, that's something else, but that, that's where they actually came from. Okay. Now the foundations, so I'm just take a step backwards. If you want to learn something, I mean, what, what do you need to understand what's going on? Um, there's a lot of functional analysis going on underneath integral equations, especially some of the very important theorems like the representative theorem, the Reese, Reese theorem, uh, um, Mercer's theorem and so on. But the question is, do you need to know it in the library? But the background is useful. It's got a lot of numerical stuff as well, and a lot of stochastic analysis. So you'll be talking about kernel methods for probability distribution. So then you're getting into the area of probability distributions, uh, the big integral theory and that kind of stuff. So it's uh, it's not the, uh, if you look at it mathematically, it's probably one of the heaviest branches of mathematics, you might say. The famous Sybenko 1989 universal appro approximation theorem um, talks about universal approximations using artificial neural networks of a certain depth and a certain width. That's, um, to be honest, I don't really understand what, I read that article about 10 times, I can't get anything out of it. So maybe it's just me. Uh, specifically, there are no quantitative uh, estimates on, on how many, uh, how many, uh, the width that you need and the depth that you need. And my, my students, my MSc students last year and the year before, uh, basically like uh, you try something with a certain width and depth and see if it works, do a bit of cross-validation, and if it doesn't work, put in more neurons and so on. So that's like a posteriori. So that's mathematically very uh, unsatisfying. Okay, but maybe I'm, I'm missing something. The, um, a lot of linear algebra is in there as well, of course. So you, at a certain stage, you have to solve linear systems like Kolesky decomposition, uh, computational statistics, is, which is very interesting, especially with all these Hilbert space metrics, computer science, of course, uh, so my, my feeling is, yeah, you, you probably don't need all of these foundations to understand the library, but it probably helps. Okay, some application areas, data fitting, of course, deterministic and stochastics, numerical solutions of partial differential equations. That's a big one. And in the, uh, I'd say about 20 years ago, people were solving, and probably still are PDEs using so-called radial basis functions, which are a kind of uh, kernel, of course. And this is called the meshless method. I've actually got a chapter in my book, my P, uh, FTM book, uh, a few years ago. Um, it's uh, from multiple dimensions, it, it's probably better than finite differences. The only problem is the resulting matrix, matrix is a full matrix. It's a dense matrix, which you have to solve. So there is, there is a lot of work done. Uh, okay, machine learning and classification, that's, um, that's Sean Mark will be talking about it. Uh, interesting one, the multivariate uh, optimization and integration. So the, there's an R ARX IV article by uh, Dr. Lefloc and, and, uh, and Jean Marc in December of 2019. So that's a very interesting article to have a look at to see what's going on in this area. So engineering design. So we're interested in, we talked about kernels. I hope nobody's forgotten what a kernel is, but basically, Long story short, you're interested in positive definite kernels. So if you think about the finite dimensional case, so for those of you who know linear algebra, basically your the kernel matrix with discrete points is positive definite. So the, the operator theory, so it's a branch of uh, functional analysis and uh, integral equations and partial differential equations, which is quite very elegant and very nice. It's a generalization of positive definite matrices and positive definite functions. You got positive definite functions. So it was introduced by Mercer when solving integ integral equations, basically. Yeah? So I think it was 1909 he solved the problem. So that was a really big uh, advance. It occurs in many application areas. And he characterizes, uh, his theorem characterizes a symmetric positive, semi-positive uh, uh, kernel. Okay. So we see the kernel is a function of two variables, basically, yeah? Okay. Can you hear my clock, by the way? It's, it's just a annoying, that's my cuckoo. I got two cuckoo clocks, actually. 
Well, I got three. One in the uh, in, in the uh, the dining room, but the second cooker clock, the battery doesn't work. Okay, so here's my kernels now. There's a neural network going on where in one cuckoo clock is training the other. He is, yeah, but the other one, the other one's not listening. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I thought they could synchronize, but anyway. So basically, uh, it's a bit mathematical now. So you've got three uh, uh, forms of a kernel, you might say. One is the discrete case when you're talking about a matrix. So you, get, you see the first one, A, it's basically a quadratic form. So Kij is the element of the matrix K at row I and column J, okay? And C, C is just a vector, C1 up to Cn. So you're just taking the uh, quadratic form. So that should be pretty obvious to most people. The second one is a positive definite function, that's number B. So basically F is a function which maps real numbers into complex numbers. So what you do is you form a matrix. So you form a matrix from a, a positive definite function. So it's just basically the, the difference between your xi and xj. So it's like this, it's like a, a distance. If you've got a mesh, a bunch of mesh points, you just take the distances and you have some kind of matrix. So that could, could have some applications. But the most gener generic and the most uh, 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 general uh, kernel is the uh, you're taking the integral of the kernel multiplied by a function u of x, u of y. So u is a uh, a function which can be integrated. So it's uh, the absolute value of u. If you integrate it, it, it ex exists. So in other words, the integral of this and infinity. So basically, the, these are the three forms of kernels. So just to give you a background of what you're going to do in practice with it, that's the next step. Uh, at least I think the uh, Jean Marc will talk about the quadratic forms in part A. And of course, part C as well is for later, maybe. OK, here's some more examples. So I'm just taking x and y to be n-dimensional vectors. So the L2 norm, it's, it's Euclidean norm, I think to call it. It's the sum of squares of the absolute value and the square root. So that's a fairly well-known one. But you've got other kernels called uh, the uh, x and y, functions of x and y always, just the transpose of x multiplied by, the, by y. So you've got some more, the Laplacian kernel. You've got a polynomial kernel. And there's, uh, Hundreds of kernels, actually. So, so that just just gives you an idea. Okay, so I think we should just carry on. So you got you got some ideas. So basically, to understand kernels, I suppose all you're saying is all you need to know is a bit of linear algebra, right? Which is fine. You see here the uh, oh yeah x minus y norm. That's just x x j squared minus x j minus y j squared and so on. So it's all the same. Here's another one. Inner product in the Hilbert space. We haven't talked about the Hilbert space yet. So that's just uh, it's just an inner product. So you like uh, okay, well, let's carry on. Gaussian again the radial basis function. So the Gaussian kernel is uh, something which is quite popular. So probably Gaussian one is, is a winner. Maybe I don't know. Okay, something which is important as well, and also in the library, the so-called Gram Gramian matrix. I think Gram was a, a was a, a Danish accountant or something. So he, uh, or actuary actually. So he knew a bit of math. So he invented the Gram matrix. It's the Hermitian matrix. So normally you're talking about Hermitian matrices means uh, you've got complex, uh, these are symmetric complex matrices basically. So the, uh, you, you use the Gramian matrix and maybe uh, it's probably in, in Jean Marc's uh, library as well. When you're computing linear independence. So a set of vectors is linear independent if and only if the uh, 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 Gram matrix is non-zero. If they're dependent, you probably get a, a zero determinant. So basically, you've got a bunch of points, x1 up to xn. You just form the pairwise uh, inner products of your x and y, you see? So xi inner product, xi with xj, and you take it for each index i and j. And of course, the generalized uh, Gram matrix will be the uh, with the kernel function here. So these are just matrices, okay? Moving to RKHS, uh, crossing the chasm. Um, again, it's called reproducing Hilbert kernel, Hilbert spaces. It's a kind of magic because it kind of works and you don't have to know anything basically. So we we're doing all kinds of tricks we're mapping from an original space to a feature space. We need a, a feature map function, blah, blah, blah. 
but you don't need to know it. All you need to know is your kernel, basically. So it's like a one-to-one -one correspondence between the kernel itself and um, on the uh, inner products. Okay, so the RKHS is a Hilbert space. We need to talk about it at the moment. Um, and a, a very important uh, pattern which you see permeating all of the, the theory here is two functions f and g are close in the norms. So you're taking norms of functions because functions can have norms now. That's really functional analysis. Um, they're close in the norm and they will be pointwise close as well. So the pointwise estimates of the errors is determined by its um, uh, by the norm. So that's really cool. I think that's a major difference with, let's say, traditional neural networks where uh, you don't really have any estimates really in that sense. Okay, so the motivation. So basically, this is very, carry on, I've got 10 more minutes. So we, uh, we solve a problem in higher dimensional feature space. So we don't solve the problem in the original space. Uh, we, map, we map the original space into a feature space. And um, long story short again, it's not necessary. So you need some mapping. The nice thing about it is you don't know, need to know the precise form of the feature map, and you also don't know the precise, you need to know the precise form of the Hilbert space. So here's a very Mickey Mouse diagram here. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, let's say the original problem is here. This could be a support vector machine kind of thing, or the, you know, all this uh, uh, regression stuff. So you've got classification plus, uh, this could be plus one, this is minus one. But you need to, you can't do it, uh, how do you call it? You can't do it with a, uh, a linear regression, but you need some kind of quadratic stuff. You you increase the, the polynomial degree, and you hope you will get it, and you get overfitting and stuff like this. So that's the original problem. But what the kernel methods do is they actually have a function phi here, which maps uh, your original space 2D, whatever it might be, into a higher dimensional space like a 3D space, and the separator will not be a linear separator, a hyperplane between the two. So that's pretty cool. Now the formulation. So basically, now it's starting to get a bit heavy. So the formulation is X is any set of data. So this could be your original X set is here on the left hand side again. And we're mapping a feature map maps X into a, some kind of Hilbert space, whatever that's supposed to be. We don't need to know it. And of course, you know that your kernel, now lowercase, it's a, it's, a, it's a function of two variables, X and Y. And basically, here's the big deal. Your kernel evaluation is basically the in, inner product of the uh, values x, x1 and x2 of the feature map. So almost no conditions on the set x. So it's, uh, this added advantage would mean that you, that you, for example, can separate positives from negatives in higher dimensional space. And in a lower dimensional space, you, use a, um, you need all kinds of tricks. You do, 300 degree polynomials and all this kind of stuff, but just mind boggling. Okay, by the way, I didn't mention it. Good that you asked, what is a Hilbert space? Now, there's a whole bunch of terms you have to learn. Basically, it's got a, it's got a number of features. We have to know what an inner product is. So you know the inner product of two vectors, X and Y, that's the easy one. And from the inner product, you make a norm. So just let me go back and, uh, because this is kind of critical in this, to a certain extent. An inner product, here's a norm of a, an n-dimensional vector. Yeah? So yeah, the, the inner product will be just the, the sum of the xj's by the yj's, inner product of two vectors. That's a finite dimensional Hilbert space. The norm, so the norm is, so you make your, you make your inner product first of all. So you have to have an inner product. Sometimes you don't have an inner product. But you can have a norm. That's called the Banach space. But we're not talking about Banach spaces. So you get a norm from your inner product. Now here's the big deal: the space, the ensuing space, is complete in the sense that every Cauchy sequence, every sequence, converges to an element in the space itself. You've got convergence, and the uh, the convert the sequence does not convert. The, the sequence converges to an element in the space itself. And that's a really that's really a big deal, actually. And the long story short, was Cauchy in 1847 or before he made uh, mathematics respectable, actually, when with people just playing ad hoc convergence and all this sort of stuff. So he, he actually formalized it. So to make a to summarize a Hilbert space, 
it's a it's it's a complete norm norm vector space in the norm induced by the inner product all right so let's take an example everybody knows the let's consider l2 so i'm working on the interval zero one so i, I want to i want to define functions on the interval zero one okay so these are functions which map the interval to to r it could be complex numbers but it's just real numbers these are uh, L2 Lebesgue integrable functions. So the, uh, okay, so L2. So in other words, you take the square of your function here, you see? You take the square of your function, you integrate between 0 and 1, you take the square root, will give you the norm, of course, and this is less than infinity, right? So there are functions which are not in the L2, but this one is in L2. So this is obviously a space. You can see that it's an inner product space because the inner product of two functions, f and g, is just f, x, times g of x just integrated at the inner product and the corresponding norm as i've told you here but there's a corresponding metric is as well which uh, to use heavy jargon this will make it into a topological vector space you can actually work with uh, then you can start talking about convergence so this is a big deal as far as your con convergence is uh, concerned i think sean mark has also a few examples later on so this is a metric so that's just an example of uh, hilbert space there's lots of examples i I can't go into all the details because it gives it at least an idea. You're probably better off to just start with the uh, uh, n-dimensional vectors and, and play around and show that it's a Hilbert space. Actually, these are not these are not functions here. You see, people think they're functions, but they're equivalence classes of functions. So uh, two two functions are equal if they have the, if it's got the same values, except on a set of measure zero officially. So a set of measure zero is like uh, values like where the function is not defined at one, two, three, four, five, six. So the two functions can differ point-wise, but still have the same L2 norm. So L, L2 functions, and this is in the Sibenko article, he talks about L2 function. This is where, this is the part I don't understand. L2 functions are almost continuous. They're not continuous. Okay, that's just a remark. Okay, so a big deal here, as far as I'm concerned, is we want to talk about the distance kernel. So distance is, so we need some way to measure the distance. Uh, uh, Daniel, I think there was a question. Would you mind going back to the previous slide and what is X here? in here? Yeah. What is X in here was the question on the chat window. Is it a Sorry, vector what, what, what is what? Uh, is it a vector or a tensor? What is X in here was the question. X? Yeah. What X? Um, uh, I think it's in the context of F of X. X is uh, between in zero and one, eh? Huh? Okay, okay. You see here? Yeah. Is that is that the question? I think that was the question. That, that, okay, uh, let me let uh, me draw as a, as a computer. I mean, I know I know a little bit of programming as well. Here's my f, right? My x is the input, right? And my f of x, uh, my handwriting is very bad. F of x is is the output, eh? So it writes it to a number. So f of x, for example, I don't know, uh, between zero and one could, here's a very simple function. So here's zero and one. So here's my f of x, right? See zero and one. So the function is defined on zero to one, right? So it could be just the value one. So it's just a heavy side function. And outside of zero, one, it's zero. Yeah. Yep. yep. Is that a bit clear? Or I mean, like. Yeah, I think the, the question was like, is X a feature? Is it a feature? Is the feature? No, it's just, it's just, this is just an example of a Hilbert space. Okay. X, okay. Is, X is just a variable in the unit interval. Right. Okay. We so I'm just trying to tracking the chat window. I'm just, I'll uh, relay the questions, whatever comes through. Yeah. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. The features will come later on. We're not, we're not there yet. Sure. Uh, okay. Hil uh, Hil uh, L2 functions don't handle features. Okay. So the, uh, so basically, we want the bijection, the one-to-one -one correspondence between the kernel and the metric, and we talk about similarity functions. So basically, um, I'm on page 20 now. Okay, so I, I got basically two objects, A and B, but um, we've got a similarity K, A and B, and it's the, the induced distance is the similarity between A and A plus the similarity between B and B minus twice the similarity between A and B. Yeah? These are first two are called self-similarities, and the second one is cross-similarity. This is very, this, these are just sets. It doesn't mean anything. 
It's just an idea. But they will have their implementations or their uh, realizations when you start talking about probability functions and uh, two sample methods and so on. And I think John Mark has all this programmed in his library anyway, but he can talk more about it later on. But it's just to give an idea. So it's the similarity between both of the uh, sets. These could be sets or something, minus the dissimilarity, twice the dissimilarity. And it's all based on expectation theory. So the, let's, say, let's say I take point sets. So I take discrete point sets, P and Q, these are sets. So I take the similarity between P and Q to be the, um, the inner product will be the, uh, uh, the kernel for P and Q. P is in, small P is in the P set and small Q is in the Q set. So in this particular case, the, uh, the metric will be just the, um, these functions here. It's the same as before, except I'm not talking about probability points. It could be a two sample method. So P might be, uh, a set from a distribution and Q could be a set from another distribution. And you want to see if P and Q are the same. We'll talk about it in a moment. So it's, it's getting a bit heavy now. So we come to a Hilbertian metric. And so, so it's, uh, uh, maybe I just carry on, but an important remark here now is we're talking about a pseudo metric. And I'm talking about the, the following, the distance between P and Q the distance between P and Q in general could, can be zero, doesn't necessarily mean that P is equal to Q. If P is equal to Q, then of course you know that your uh, distance is zero. But the other way around is not true. Eh? So you can have two sequences converging uh, to zero. It doesn't make them the same. Eh? That's something else. So that's a very important one. And my feeling is that with all of this functional analysis, I know for a fact, that the uh, you want to make your pseudo metric into a metric, but you don't want two sequences converging, the distance converging, but uh, uh, from different populations. So that's uh, really uh, not good. Okay, so here's here's a more general, maybe upmarket example, but maybe I could just skip at the moment. Eh? The representative theorem. Now we're getting into uh, kind of my last example. The uh, basically the representative theorem. I copied it from uh, Wikipedia, but it makes things quite easy. And it's sort of compatible with the stuff I used to do in the past as well. I mean, it, the, we're talking about a, a minimizer of a function, some, some kind of risk functional on a reproducing kernel. It can be represented by a finite leading combination of kernel products evaluated uh, across the training set data. So basically your solution, your, your solution would be a, a combination of uh, some of the uh, kernels. So let me take my example. It's uh, um, I've got two examples. Here's the first one. I'm taking this, this is from the, the book by Hasty as well, but you see it being documented in the, the literature on, on artificial neural net, networks ad nauseum without giving enough detail. But I'm taking L as my loss function here, and I've got my um, input data, xj and yj. This is my uh, training data, for example. I've also got a, a Tikhonov regularization uh, parameter here. I think John Mark. Uh, takes 10 to the minus eight for this to regularize, basically to, to make the uh, your minimization problem more stable. And uh, so we've got a loss function and a penalty term. And basically my function F, I'm taking uh, as a linear combination of uh, my kernel function. So it's a function of X. So X uh, is a variable now uh, at the XJs. So the whole point about this, I need to define my alpha Js. And, uh, Small type cloud, typing error here. Uh, so my, my uh, regularization form is functional is here as well. But basically, long story short, in this particular approach, uh, because I've only got 35 minutes, the kernel property, we've got an infinite dimensional problem, which reduces to a, uh, how do you say, a finite dimensional criterion. So basically a minimization of this, this problem here, plus the, um, the lambda, the Tikhonov lambda multiplied by a quadratic form. And we can solve it by uh, simple numerical algorithms. And I think Sean Mark will be talking about, you can solve it using Kolesky decomposition. In other words, a linear solver, not a stochastic gradient method. Okay, so the second example, I need to carry on now. How am I doing for time three? I'm, I'm pushing it, am I? Three? Hello? 
Anybody? Anybody? Can you hear me? Three? Sorry, I was kind of trying to unmute. Sorry about that. It was. Oh, sorry. So I thought. Oh, it was, sorry, uh, I was trying to unmute. I didn't want my eyes out. Um, I think um, you know uh, we have another forty minutes. Um, so you know. Okay. If, um, okay. Let, let, just let me just let me round off then. Okay, so the data interpolation is something similar. Again, you arrive at a linear system for data interpolation with the kernels. We've got the two sample problem, basically. Our two, uh, this is a Kolmogorov Smirnov kind of uh, idea. You've got two observations, and you want to know if the two are the uh, same. So you have a, 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 a biased uh, maximum mean discrepancy. So you can actually compute it, and you've got the, the kernel distance here. So this is like a pattern itself. So the sum of the kernel is here, minus twice the sum of the uh, cross kernels, plus the second kernel. So I need to carry on. So it's the same. It's all documented by the, um, what's his name? Greton, he's, he's in there somewhere. If you look up Greton, uh, he's, um, he's doing quite a lot of work. Okay, so I need, need to finish now. So just finish off. The, the thesis we did last year are, was, and we've got a, a, a software architecture for doing it. The basic story is here, you've got your data generation, you've got your training data, the usual stuff. So we made a pattern from it. So each thesis is built on the same kind of data flow diagram and software design. But the, the, the relevant part here is the uh, training optimizers here. We're using, uh, we use the uh, stochastic gradient method, uh, ADAM or differential evolution. And at the end, when you come out here, you do your uh, cross validation and so on. So basically, this is a good example for us in the future going forward, because instead of the uh, um, ANN training, we would use uh, kernel methods. So we'd like to put in the John Marks uh, uh, library here and try it with students and research people and so on and in industry. The, the big thing as a software design is that you have to write good interfaces here. So you just plug and play. Okay, so the uh, I finish up now features. I got a split screen PowerPoint. I'm very proud of it. I used this for the first time last week. So in my features, uh, if I had to compare ANNs and kernels, feature ANN is basically, as far as I can see, very heavily influenced by linear algebra and nonlinear iterative solvers, which converge or don't converge. Uh, and kernel methods, functionality is Cauchy sequence underwater. By the way, for those of you who are interested, the gradient descent method was invented by Cauchy in 1847. Okay, so the, uh, the a posteriori error, error estimates with all these methods, you don't really know. Sometimes it doesn't converge. You, it's, it's not like finite differences or finite elements or uh, kernels. Um, in this case here, the a priori error estimates, in my opinion, it's all it's all based, uh, people are not looking around a lot, uh, enough, basically. Maybe that's just, I mean, I did my degree 50, at least 50 years ago. So maybe I'm just, I'm just an old uh, fossil. But the, uh, there's a lot of mathematical stuff which is missing, basically. You're just not doing it right. And in this case here, it is deep. And discrete spaces, uh, it's all matrices and so on, you know, but continuous space, you know. Um, it's one uh, algebraic topology said, the, the world is continuous, but the human brain is discrete. Okay, lots of parameter, hyper parameters, you know, the learning rate and all this kind of stuff, um, taking off parameters. These seem, uh, kernel methods seem to have less parameters, which is good. The uh, universal uh, approximation theorem, I think the corresponding theorem is the representative theorem. Basically, you can solve your problem as a linear combination of kernels. So that's, that's something to talk about, maybe. And with a lot of things as well, but in, in not just machine learning. People start with the solution. They're throwing a solution at you. And then uh, the kernel meds start with the problem description. Like a, when you get a flat tire, you're going on holidays. Uh, you drive around the block a few more times, you think it'll fix itself, but it doesn't. It's called extensive numerical approximation uh, experimentation. Uh, you just need to start with the problem description. But these are just my own idiosyncratic uh, remarks. Okay, last one line is just something to get everybody uh, up and running. Can we solve kernel problems using Kolesky decomposition? Is cross-validation needed for kernel methods? How much functional analysis do you need to know? Do you like stochastic gradient methods, right? Um, and UAT and the meaning of life. And then Mark will come along with his Antioch uh, slide there, famous 
holy grenade of Antioch. So that's a, it's a showstopper, isn't it? Or maybe start the show. Okay, so that's uh, questions. Go for it. Cross the chasm. So thank you very much. I'm finished now. Thank you so much, Daniel. This was an excellent uh, overview. Um, in fact, uh, I think we should have uh, probably kind of made this into a two-hour session just so that we had enough time uh, for everybody. Um, can we do something? You know, I know there are many questions and I'm pretty sure uh, you know, we'll run out of time if we just answer all the questions now. Can we do the presentation? Uh, can John Mark present now and then we'll have the last 10 or 15 minutes for question and answers? We'll kind of That's combine the question and answers to then. Then, then, yeah, you can sort of relate my stuff to John Mark's stuff. And then you can actually one one question. That's your own question. That's pretty better. That's okay with me. How about yeah, you, John? So let's do that, and then you know I can capture all the chat logs, and then in case we are not able to you know answer all the questions, I can circulate it so that we can like you know get all those question answers, and we can we can kind of circulate it with the audience too afterwards. Yeah, sure, fine. That's okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Um, so, uh, John Mark, can I uh, hand over the stage to you? Okay. Okay. Well, I think you should be able to share your screen. Uh, Daniel, this was an excellent presentation. I learned so much more. Thank you. Thank you. So is it okay for you? Yeah, we can see your screen. Thank you. So so uh, I think I'm, 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 I'm starting just right now, three. Is it okay? Yes, that's right. Okay. So, so first of first, uh, thank you very much, Daniel, for this uh, very nice introduction with uh, the theoretical part of uh, reproducing uh, kernel Hilbert space. So I will now really focus on the implementation uh, side of uh, what just told uh, Daniel about. And thank you so much, Sri, for uh, your kind invitation for giving this talk. And uh, indeed, I will echo a lot of uh, a lot of talk that I've seen uh, in your presentation because I will also focus on auditing method for uh, artificial uh, intelligence algorithm during this talk. And I will I will speak and we and will give very practical example toy example of what could be uh, algorithm 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 uh, audit of artificial intelligence uh, methods. So let me introduce myself quickly. Uh, I'm heading a very small uh, research and development team. Uh, this, uh, this, uh, so we are really operational guys, and we are uh, we are operating with inside the MPG partner that is a mid-sized French consulting firm that operating in the finance industry in the risk management. So. For me, it's this kind of uh, of, of uh, company are very interesting for uh, for uh, for research. Why? Because uh, uh, as this Grant University or MPG partner are really in touch with industrial problems, and our side of view is to say, okay, we are in contact with with industrial problem, but we we we, we trade this industrial problem. With with uh, with fundamental research, so I, I would like also to quote some names, and I would like to 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 quote the name of Philip Leflock, with whom I work uh, very tightly uh, on the theoretical part of my job, and with MPG we are developing uh, a lot of application uh, for institutional clients, and I also and we also work uh, as you have seen. Uh, with Daniel Defi. So let's go just right now to the to, to, to what I would like to talk about. I would like to talk about uh, Python library, which name is CodePy. Uh, code means for curse of dimensionality. So this is a Python library. And uh, this small Python library uh, that we use today for our internal needs of our company provides some tools for machine learning, statistical learning, and numerical simulation. And now you've got the plan of my talk. I will talk about machine learning. I will talk then about statistical learning, even if machine learning and statistical learning are almost the same thing. And I will go afterward to, to, toward numerical simulation. 
And this small library uh, is kernel based. It means that it's an implementation of all what I've uh, talked uh, Daniel just before me. From a technical point of view, uh, it's a library that is implemented, uh, its implementation is C++. And uh, we have two kinds of interface today with this library. This library can is interface from one part of its functionalities with Python. And we have also another kind of interface, that is the graph database that we built uh, internally. OK, this library is quite interesting for our internal needs. Uh, it means that uh, it's somehow complete, but it's also a competitor of more traditional uh, uh, and more popular uh, artificial intelligence platform like TensorFlow, Terno, PyTorch, Scikit-Learn. Oh, OK, so we are basically competing with artificial intelligence, neural network, deep learning, support vector machine, etc. Etc. But we never use uh, today uh, this platform. Why? Because this small library uh, performs better, at least in the scope of the industrial problem that we treat today. And we use this library since five years now. More than five years, I think it's uh, six or seven years. And OK, uh, this library is an internal library. But I think. Uh, we are, we are thinking very loudly and very strongly to give a public access to this library. It means that today we have a people installer. You, can, you could use tomorrow this library, uh, but the point is that we are very small uh, research and development teams. So why you are doing this? Because we think that this small library uh, might be a quality standard for artificial intelligence method. And in that direction, what we propose to the community is to say, OK, I think we have something a little bit special here. Maybe we should share it. And we should put in common uh, our resources and try to, 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 to standardize these tools. And uh, in, that, uh, in that direction, we put uh, our user manual uh, publicly available today. So just consult uh, the last slide of this show, and you will have links to our, our uh, user manuals. So let's go uh, a little bit deeper. I think that uh, most of you are more used to uh, artificial intelligence uh, approach. So what, uh, what is CodeP about, talk about? CodeP is like uh, any other uh, of the more popular frameworks that I've told just before. It's a, it's a library, Python library, that speak about distribution. So what means distribution? It means that exactly like uh, for intelligence, artificial intelligence method, you have X, that is a training set. You have Y, that is a weight set. You have Z, that is a test set. So on the right side, you have an example of what is one X, but we have several X. And take care to, 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 to this number N of X, because I will toy a lot of uh, with the size of what it's called the training set. OK? And, and I will give a little bit later an example of, of, of uh, such training set. What you can see here is a handwritten digit. It's a MNEST uh, problem of Yann Le Kuhn. That's a very academical problem and is used uh, universally to benchmark uh, most of, most of uh, artificial intelligence methods for supervised, supervised learning. So it's a library that talks about distribution. And like other distribution, it talks about kernels. kernels uh, was introduced by, by uh, Daniel just before, but it, uh, uh, Kernel, uh, Daniel talked about, uh, about uh, uh, quite uh, known and famous Kernel, like Gaussian one, but I would like to quote another very famous, uh, very famous uh, Kernel, that are the kernel induced by neural networks. And indeed, what is interesting in our library is that 
we can interface directly neural networks and we can interface a neural network and translate it into a kernel. They are exactly the same things, both. And as, uh, as, as uh, quoted Daniel before, kernel are very, very versatile uh, object. You can sum them, you can multiply them, you can compose them, you can pipe them, it means that you chain them one uh, after the other, you can compose them with map. Indeed, we have a whole section of kernel engineering that allow to adapt our kernel to a given problem. So, we are talking about machine learning. So, what is our library for machine learning? Is an oracle. It's Oracle as other library. It means that uh, you have uh, what we call a projection operator. This projection operator, uh, if you are uh, more used to artificial intelligence method, this is the, exactly the equivalent of a feed forward neural network, but it's a little bit more general, that uh, feed forward neural network. So, as you can see, we have a predictor function. This predictor function takes into in, as input a training set, a weight set, and a test set. And obviously a kernel that adapts uh, your problem, uh, that, that is adapted to your problem. And OK, I, I have not uh, talked so much about the weight set. But uh, now uh, I will try to, 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 to give you some intuition of uh, what is a weight set for a kernel method. When I will speak later on of extrapolation, it, will, uh, it means that it will take the weight set as being the training set. When I'm speaking about interpolation, it means that the weight set is equal to the test set. But I can also take as weight set the one that is induced by any neural networks. And I will talk also a little bit later about another kind of weight set that we call sharp discrepancy sequences. So I don't want to come uh, into details, but sharp discrepancy sequences are the equivalent of learning for artificial intelligence methods. And OK, so you input x, y, z, your kernel, and what you got in output. It depends exactly of what is f. If f is uh, function values or vector valued function, then in output, you will have a prediction. But if you don't uh, input any uh, function value, you will have a wall operator uh, that that is a real operator, and you can uh, and you and you can uh, use it after if you want to, to 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 apply this operator to another test set or that kind of stuff. Okay, but now what is not copy copy for machine learning, as was uh, uh, advertised by uh, Daniel. Uh, CutP is not at all an Olean grenade of anti arch for those who know the Monty Python. Uh, it means that we never rely on, uh, on the universal approximation theorem to pretend that our methods are converging. Indeed, in our method, uh, and, and uh, Daniel insisted a lot uh, on this point just before, we can tell you before uh, running your learning machine, we can tell you how confident you can be onto the prediction of our uh, learning machine. So I would like to, 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 to discuss a little bit this, uh, this uh, a, a priori estimation error. So on f of z is a real function. You don't know it. F the Z is your prediction. And what uh, you would like to know is uh, how confident you can be into, the, into your prediction. And for this prediction, you have uh, the error that your learning machine will commit can be divided into two parts. 
The first part is a pure distributional, uh, it's a purely distributional measurement. And, uh, and uh, Daniel uh, just gave the formula before. It tells you something is that if Z, the test set, is very far for, from your learning set, then you have a distance that will be very big, and you can't ex you can't expect your learning machine to give a good result if you are really too far uh, from your training data. And the other part is exactly the norm of your function in a functional space. But both are Python function. It means that we, in, for each of our learning machine, uh, we provide uh, we provide uh, 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 error framework that allow you to 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 be confident or not into your prediction. It means that you can be auditable. But it's not only a question of being auditable. Just imagine uh, imagine the developer that use this kind of machine. And usually, if you work in a corporate or in a company, you will work with a business analyst. This guy will tell you, OK, uh, here is a specification. So you can uh, implement this machine. And now you can tell to your boss, OK, I've implemented a machine, so now you can take your decision, but you can take your decision knowing how confident you can be into the prediction. And in turn, your boss can tell you, okay, I understand your point, but maybe we should try to, to, to lower uh, this, uh, this error bound. Why? Because for my usage, the error, the error formula gives uh, non-acceptable results. So can we work on the kernel engineering? Can we work on the data set, on the model? And uh, th this can be a very fruitful exchange also to, 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 to make uh, your learning machine better. So, okay, we have, we have a nice uh, error framework tools, but it doesn't tell you up to now how performant our learning machine are when compared to more popular uh, one. So here's the next slide is a benchmark. So we are now benchmarking a kernel method, indeed two kernel methods, with a neural network one. So the neural network one is a very famous one, is a, is a flagship uh, neural network of TensorFlow. That is the one that is out of the box when you, when you download TensorFlow, so you can use the straightforwardly and, and uh, computing this kind of figure. And against this, uh, against this uh, neural network, TensorFlow 1, we build two machines. The first one is the extrapolation function that I, that I, uh, that I detailed some, slide, uh, some slides ago. And we build also another machine uh, that use a little bit the weight set in order to tune the complexity, so it means the computational time. And the test is a MNES test, so uh, I don't detail this test here. I, I assume that uh, everybody uh, here knows the test. The test uh, just, just to summarize it, consists in uh, predicting uh, labels, unwritten digit, and it's a MNEST test. So we just take the Yann LeCun database to do this, to perform this test. And okay, we measure, we, we are measuring uh, our machine in two ways. The first one are accuracy. That is, in this test, the accuracy is, uh, is, is quite well understood. It's just the percentage of correctly predicted labels. And, and you can, as you can see, the blue one is the flagship of TensorFlow. The yellow one is the copy extrapolation. And the red one is in between in terms of uh, performance. So I've quoted some numbers here so that you can see, uh, you can appreciate uh, with quantified uh, score. 
So, as you can see, the the range of our machine uh, gives really very quite impressive result in a range of value uh, into which uh, you have few data. It means that this method are able to capture uh, more uh, more accurately uh, features with very scarce data. So scarce data are very interesting uh, regime for machine learning. Why? Because in most, uh, in, a, in a lot of cases, you don't have enough data. But there is also another case where you have plenty of data, but you don't need to use so many data because you just need to, to, to bond yourself to a given accuracy. Let's say 1% error is enough. So you can survive with very few data. And with this method, you can really exploit uh, this regime very finely. Uh, now let's go on to the, the, the execution time uh, benchmark of this three method. So as you can see, in terms of computational times, one in this cubic in terms of size of the sampling uh, of the training set. It means that uh, quite quickly, uh, it is very computationally extensive, uh, intensive, sorry. But as you can see, there is also the green one that is that uh, that has linear in terms of training set size behavior. It means that it doesn't cost so much, and it's always better than the than the, the crude the TensorFlow. Uh, method. So I'm not telling you that these are the best score that you can obtain on the MNST uh, problem. I'm just telling you that when I'm benchmarking standard method, uh, uh, these are really, uh, I'm, I'm using really standard kernel. So I'm using <coughs> the standard uh, TensorFlow method to benchmark against. And what I'm telling you is that somehow this kind of test, you can do it for any Kegel test, and you will always obtain this kind of patterns. It means that basically, this uh, this uh, library is a Kegel killer apps. So now, <coughs> let's move to statistical learning. Statistical learning is very similar to 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 uh, machine learning, but uh, here I would like to emphasize one particularity of kernel methods. Uh, we talked about distribution some slides ago, and we said, okay, uh, this is the same thing. Uh, kernel methods are talking about distribution. It's more or less the same thing that, uh, that uh, neural network. Indeed, it's not exactly true because reproducing kernel is best space is not only a theory that talk about distribution. It's a theory that talk about function, functional spaces defined above distribution. So it means that we have a component that neural networks doesn't have. So here is a, a, a first basic, uh, a basic observation. When we ship any uh, learning machine, we ship also with this machine, a lot of differential operators. So for instance, here you can see we have a NABLA, but we have, we have not only NABLA, we have also the inverse NABLA. We have divergence operator, Laplace. We have all kinds, we have a, a whole zoo of differential operators. And for statistical learning, something that is very handful with this kind of operators is that you can use them to have access to uh, optimal transport theory. So I'm not sure that uh, you are all familiar with optimal transport theory, but I will, do, I will give you some particular example of what we can achieve with this theory today. I would like now to, to, to introduce to you this uh, quite interesting function that is a Python function in code P, that is a transition probability operator. So let us try to describe this, uh, this function. X is, 
how could I introduce you this function? Uh, I think that's the best thing to 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 give you an uh, uh, an intuition of this function. Things to things that you have a uh, handful of sand in your in your in your in your hand, and you should just show it on your room. This is x. Now z, it's another distribution. So you take your right hand, it should do exactly the same. F the z here is totally optional uh, function value, and you have a kernel. And if you input x and z, what you will obtain uh, in output, you will obtain a, a matrix, a stochastic matrix, more precisely. That means, uh, uh, okay, a uh, stochastic matrix. I'm not sure that you're familiar with this kind of uh, mathematical object. Just a positive matrix. That means that each term are positive, and sums on each line are equal to one. And this, uh, this, uh, this mathematical object are very uh, interesting in the, in the finance area because they represent the probability of transition of one state to another. So they are very widely used in the finance area. So I will give you some example, for instance, if you want to, 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 try, to, to price a portfolio or to compute any risk uh, with historical data, or if you want to, to, to generate your own sample, so you, can, you have already your X and your Z, Z here, and this function can just output between any time, uh, any two time, a stochastic matrix giving you the probability of transition. So for for the finance uh, for finance applications, it's a quite important uh, it's a quite important uh, algorithm. But uh, I think there there exists a lot of other. Uh, application of this function. Uh, the first one that come to my, to my mind are uh, Bayesian cl classifier, even if I never dig in very deeply into this, uh, this kind of application. So, okay, this is a little bit conceptual. Let's go to a more practical, uh, to, to, to a practical experiment. Okay, now, as I told you, X, you just take it as whatever uh, process you want. So we, we are now focusing on a very particular problem that is called the Bachelier problem. The Bachelier problem consists uh, in uh, considering a Brownian process in which you take all uh, parameters as randomly generated. Okay, so I'm just taking one kernel. And with this process, I'm just uh, sampling at time t equal one. Uh, first uh, set and at t equal to a second set. And then on the second set on z, on, on z um, I'm defining a function that is an option payoff. So it means you have here a and you just take the product of z uh, at um, t equal to make the this this is just defining you an option written uh, onto a basket. And we can do this experiment in any dimension. I don't even remember in which dimension uh, this picture comes from. I think it's a two-dimensional uh, experiment. And obviously, uh, you just take random weight uh, in order to be sure not to use closed formula. Uh, what is interesting in uh, this experiment is that, uh, well, it's quite easy to, to have a close formula to benchmark your result against. And from a, a numerical point of view, it means that you sample Z, that is the red F, F of Z of Z uh, here, just represent option payoff. And from all this noise, what we are trying to do is to deduce the red curve, that is the exact value given by by the closed formula. And now we are, to, we are going to benchmark um, a deep learning approach against kernel methods on this particular problem. And here are the results. So 
for this problem, and if you want, you can interpret this uh, this uh, this slide as uh, an example, toy example of what could be an algorithmic audit uh, today. Uh, it means that if you take a deep learning method that in this red, you can consider three other methods. The first one is a crude uh, uh, projection method that used the prediction operator that I introduced some slide before. The third uh, one in uh, that is in yellow, it's just a straightforward application of the function P that has introduced two slides before. And now what I'm saying is that, guys, uh, maybe there's a more clever uh, way of just randomly generating X and Z. Maybe you can work a little bit to find better X and better Z. And this is what we call learning for kernel methods, or what we call sharp discrepancy sequences. And what we are doing here is that we are just uh, computing scores. So we are we know what uh, are the exact value, and we have predicted value, so we can do the difference. And here is what we are, uh, the score are computed in terms of basis point. A basis point is exactly a percentage of RMSE error. I think that everybody knows what a RMSE error is. So, and here are the results. We have uh, four methods to benchmark. Okay, the first one is quite good with, oops, sorry, with only 64 uh, samples we get an accuracy of 3.40%. The yellow one reached this level with uh, approximately uh, 512. And for the other two, they are not converging method. I mean, it means that you can stack uh, and you can, you can burn all your graphical card. You will never reach better uh, uh, result than this one. Okay, so it means that uh, at least for statistical learning, kernel methods are really better than, than uh, deep learning method today. So next slide. Here is still another uh, quite interesting uh, application for statistical learning uh, that is due to 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 uh, optimal transportation algorithm. Here, what we implemented is what is called a polar factorization algorithm. Okay, if you want to know more about polar factorization, I think there are quite well documented Wikipedia page about this problem. But uh, here, what we want to, to illustrate is a very handy tool that is built uh, using polar factor the polar factorization. It is uh, what we call today the sampling function. I have no better name, I'm sorry. Uh, here is, uh, is this function. In this function, you have x. x is any samples of any stochastic, uh, of any uh, random variable. So in input, you have uh, e id, or not e id, or any, uh, any sampling of a random variable. And n is just an integer. It just, uh, you just ask to your sampling machine to, to the following question. I give you a distribution, uh, give me back n, z, uh, e, d sample of this distribution. And, uh, okay, here is, is a very simple uh, graphical, in, uh, graphical illustration. Suppose that you have a bimodal distribution. Here we are talking about uh, a three dimensional distribution that is bimodal. Uh, so, since it is a three-dimensional uh, distribution, uh, I chose to represent it on first axis, second axis here, and first axis, third axis here. Okay. And uh, the in blue are the original distribution, and in the red are the distribution that has been generated. And the distribution that is generated share very close statistical property with the original one. I mean that you can use a Kolmogorov-Smirnov test 
and you would be unable to distinguish both distribution. Uh, uh, Jamal, I think we're getting close to one o'clock. Um, yeah, so I don't know how much uh, time you need. Maybe you can go over another five minutes. Ah, okay, so I have to, to, to go quick. Okay, let's very quick. <laughs> let's, uh, I would look uh, also of another aspect of CodePy. CodePy is quite interesting because uh, we, can, we can do quite sophisticated numerical simulation. The reason is very simple. I already given the same slide, some uh, slide before, is be as we have a whole collection of differential an integral operation, operator, basically uh, we can solve any partial differential equation and you can do it in any dimension and we can do it with convergent method. And as I show you some slide ago, we can do it also with, uh, with optimal accuracy or computational times. So let's give you an example of realization of what we are doing uh, with Copy, we are doing this kind of example since five years now. Uh, the, what we've done and with what we have achieved so far is a fully functional prototype of front office risk managing engine. It means that you can uh, input in this uh, front office uh, risk managing engine any kind of stochastic process in any dimension. It means, uh, any stochastic local volatility, you can even feed it with historical data. And uh, you can also consider any kind of function. It means payoff strategy. You can also compute optimal control strategy, that means aging, whatever you want. I think we can deal and handle any problem coming from industrial finance today with this framework. And this framework is quite interesting because, uh, so we can treat basically any backward stochastic differential or forward stochastic differential equation. The engine that is working behind is a partial differential equation solving solver engine. It means that forward we are solving for Kerplanck, backward it's Kolmogorov. Uh, we can do uh, with this method, we can handle a huge number of risk sources. For the MNST problem, for instance, I show you an example in dimension 7 and 84, exactly. And for, uh, we can also handle the huge portfolio. Uh, we are talking about uh, thousands and thousands of lines that can be treated by a simple laptop. It's, we, are, we are providing with this method uh, uh, auditable uh, results because we, are, we have worst of error bones. And we can do any kind of risk measurement with this method today in, in this context. Uh, we can give you a price, but we can also give you forward prices, but conditional forward prices, conditional forward grid, EPE. Uh, uh, so we can do any problem coming from industrial finance. It's there, VAR, stress test, investment strategy. You want to use it for arbitrage, for LM. We have tons of example, uh, operational example today. And you can tune very easily this kind of machine. I mean, if you want to have instant, uh, instant result, you can do it. But you can also uh, be very accurate uh, and and uh, and letting your 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 machine. Uh, and and the results are so good that I decided to invest myself from my own pocket in a in a in a marketing strategy. So the first argument I think are for investors for this kind of strategy. It means that these are really good uh, pricing engine. The second is that for the, all those today that are trying and uh, to, to, to do their best to solve this kind of problem with neural network, guys, there's no way that you can beat this method. These are optimal uh, methods. You could work thousands of years. You won't be able to beat this method from an algorithmic point of view. And finally, I would like to, 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 to say that, okay, uh, we are breaking the curse of dimensionality since 10 years now. Maybe it's time for, uh, for all those that work into this area to move forward a little bit. So let's, my last slide <coughs> is just to open up 
what uh, I've said uh, up to now. Uh, so as you have as you have seen, we have a framework that is capable of doing machine learning, artificial intelligence, statistical learning, price uh, for finance application, but not only, it's a general uh, partial differential equation solver. We can tackle any kind of other equation. For instance, we are toying a lot now with that. Here, I give you a, a realization with this framework. It's a very simple, it's not serious at all, but it's a simulation of a Navier-Stokes uh, uh, viscous equation of a viscous fluid flowing on a pipe. This kind of numerical scheme are share, let's say, they share some similarity with uh, with uh, techniques, numerical techniques that is called smooth particle hydrodynamic. hydrodynamic. This kind of numerical scheme, you use it for astronomical simulation, but video game, and you can do you can do you can do a lot of things with this library today. And finally, to end uh, to end this talk, I just provide uh, our bibliography if you want to dig in and to. To, 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 to know a little bit more. Just uh, some word about the, the algorithmic part. The algorithmic part is most of the results that are available here are, uh, are Jupyter notebooks. It means that you can reproduce it at home and you can start from this, uh, from any of our work to develop your own apps. So, I think I'm finished now. Thank you very much. And uh, is there any question, maybe? Uh, in fact, there are a lot of questions, uh, John Mark. Uh, I'm not sure how much time we'll have. Um, so uh, one thing I'll do is I will collect the chat and uh, I will send it to both you and uh, Daniel so that way you know, we can get back the answers and we can post it. Um, I was wondering uh, on the CodPy um, you know, package, is that something people can download and try it out or is that something? Yes, uh, I am a little bit embarrassed uh, on this question. The, the point is that, uh, yes, in, theoretically, yes, you can. You can install it uh, like uh, pip install CodeP, it works. The point is that we don't have enough resources to, to, to deal with maintenance and evolution. So, okay, I, I have to find a way uh, to, to solve this issue. Uh, okay. But we are lacking of resources, basically. Okay, okay, cool. So the other question is, um, in, the, in the context of uh, you know, applications, um, what kinds of applications do you foresee you know, as computation increases and with generalized you know, machine learning methods and also opportunity learning that you know, happening? Uh, what kinds of applications do you foresee with uh, you know, Hilbert spaces in general and also your particular package? <laughs> it could be a, yeah. giant, a, a giant question for both you and Daniel. I, I think uh, that the first answer is quite clear. The, 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 all what you can do with artificial intelligence, uh, artificial intelligence platform, you can do it with this, uh, with this framework. So we have access to all what have access to artificial intelligence. But it's a little bit more uh, tricky than that because we are adding now a new dim dimension to artificial intelligence that are functional spaces. So the range of application today is just infinite. It's just your imagination. <laughs> we can do a lot mm -hmm. of things. Okay, okay. Cool. Uh, Daniel, do you want to add anything to that? Um, to, yeah, I mean, as, as far as we're concerned, uh, I'm like, a, I'm a sort of mentor or supervisor. Um, I've got a lot of, in that sense, contacts. I would say a lot of people are interested in learning new stuff. That's obvious. I mean, your career and blah, blah, blah. Um, you could set up uh, certain projects to promote this uh, wonderful library uh, um, using maybe, um, you could write your MSc, PhD thesis on it and make it more widespread in the market and more well documented. Uh, my own opinion about the uh, all of these articles on artificial neural networks, they're for an in-group. You, The only people who understand all these artificial neural network articles are people 
to actually have done it. And it's it's not for the I mean it's just a huge amount of uh, references and so on. See, so it's not a learning, it's not a tutorial. Uh, uh, and th th this method could be documented. It's got a, a great basis in functional analysis, and it, it's maths. It's real maths. And as you can see, what the Jean Marc is saying, I mean, you, a lot of this stuff you can't do with, let's say, traditional maths, as it were. A lot of so, for example, one of the things that we're interested in is getting in contact with universities and so on. I mean, I'm a supervisor for the last six years. I've in total, I've had about uh, 50 MSc students, which is quite a lot. I've supervised uh, and it all went pretty well. I mean, Birmingham University, I've got the, I trained the people in Warwick and uh, many of my students take my course to go to UCB. Of course, you probably know the, I'm the originator of the Baruch, both of the C++ courses. So there's a lot of opportunity and, you know, I'm one of these guys who writes everything up nowadays, you know, I mean, so. I can write everything up and promote this technology and help people use the technology. And uh, so some of the bottlenecks, as it were, can be resolved in a number of ways, which is beneficial to everybody. Yeah. You, yeah. You know, of, course, of course, it's great if you get some money from somebody, but it's, uh, you, you get money from people, you spend it basically. Yeah. So it's, and then it's gone. Yeah? But it's better to, to promote a certain. Yeah, a network of universities and, uh, and industry banks and so on, right? So I would say the, the main focus is uh, getting this library up and more. Uh, you can split it up into uh, maybe sub libraries, so different facets of the library. So that, that there's uh, many ways you can go to Rome, basically, as a where. So there's there's, there's, there's opportunities. Huh? Every, everything's possible if you wish hard enough. So it's uh, I, I reckon it, it should be. Uh, but we have to promote it as well. And, uh, but the opportunity is there and the, the contacts are there. And uh, so it's just a matter of doing it. Absolutely. And That's you know, just... we'd be happy to like help out spread the word in case you have any Jupyter notebooks you can share, um, you know, even if it's only readable at this point and you know, when the time comes, if that's something you could share, you know, we can share it through the Q Academy and make yeah. it available to the yeah. university and well, the audience if need. Yeah, but I would say indeed, good documentation for the library. And you go to Python, you could just say PIP, uh, John Mark uh, Mercier Library, point. off you go. Yes, and uh, obviously, if, if there are good wheels that, uh, that are interested in having a closer look to, that, to this library, do not hesitate to contact me or Daniel, or, uh, yeah. and uh, we'll, uh, we'll try to, 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 to settle on something. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, this was an absolute pleasure, Daniel, John Mark. Uh, thank you for sharing your immense knowledge on, um, you know, uh, both the theoretical aspects and also the pragmatic aspects of how to apply to both spaces in the context of machine learning. And, uh, you know, as we end today's session, I want to remind you that uh, uh, the next week's session is going to be more on the practical side of things from uh, Raghu Kulkarni, who is at Discover, and he's leading efforts on building both uh, interpretable machine learning, but also has the challenge of making sure that that gets applied. Because I know, at least for people in the United States, the Discover credit card is something which most people would be familiar with and would be using it. Yeah. So you're processing uh, transactions at a very high scale. What kinds of issues are going to be uh, looked at? And also from a lending perspective, what are the various issues companies like Discover needs yeah, to yeah, work yeah. with. So uh, Gragu Kulkarni, who, uh, do you know, who works with those kinds of efforts, so he's going to be presenting. That's going to be on March the 3rd between 12 o'clock and 1 o'clock. So I look forward to seeing you there. And again, for information yeah. about uh, the next week's and future lectures, please go yeah. to www.quantuniversity.com and you should be able to see all the information there. Yeah. So till uh, next week, I uh, uh, would like to thank you again for presenting. And uh, Daniel and uh, Mark, you, uh, do you want to have uh, any last words? I've just, I, I, I've just got a last question. Is that OK? Uh, uh, please, please, please go ahead. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I see on the bottom of my screen um, Q&A 5 something and chat 61. Is that 61 questions that uh, uh, attendees have? Is it or? Uh, 
Yeah, so there are there are a lot of questions. Uh, so what I'm going to do is uh, we weren't able to like get through all the questions. So oh, sure, yeah. I'm going to take all the chat log and I will send it to both you and uh, you know uh, John Mark. Yeah. So once you get the answers, I'll just collate that and then make it available for people to uh, you know all the attendees can get an email with all the answers. Okay, so you'll send in a file or something. Or... Exactly, I'll send you the chat file, chat log, and you can. Okay. Like, and we can we can just open it and edit it and give the answers and so on. Eh? Absolutely, yeah. that's fine. Yeah, that sounds good. Yes, perfect. So there's a lot of interest. Thank you. Okay, great. Sixty-one. Have okay. okay. oh, good night. Three. Good I'm night, John Mark Oak, as well. See you later. Eh? See you later. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Arrivederci.